Thank you for joining the James Wilson Institute this evening. My name is Garrett Snedeker, and I am the Deputy Director of the James Wilson Institute. If you could please take a moment to silence your cell phones, we would be grateful. Before I introduce the program, I would like to thank our gracious host, Hillsdale College, and its Executive Vice President and Dean Matthew Spaulding. This program also would not be possible without the helpful staff of Hillsdale's Kirby Center, including Adele Ritter and Claire Bachma, both generous in their time and spirit in the preparations for this evening. Next, we gather less than a month after JWI and so many of our friends in attendance suffered a devastating loss when our devoted friend and colleague Michael Yulman passed. Michael was one of our JWI senior scholars, a regular presence on the faculty of our fellowship each summer for young lawyers, and a speaker at our uh, senior seminars for the, the judges, academics, and seasoned attorneys who are joining us from out of town this weekend. Michael was a longtime friend of our founder and director, Hadley Arcus. We made available outside of the room on the uh, registration table some copies of Professor Arcus's memorial to Michael, detailing Michael's long life and career in the law, taken from Professor Arcus's book, Natural Rights and the Right to Choose. Calling him a friend and, in his words, a presently unindicted co-conspirator is something I will always treasure. We miss him dearly, and we dedicate this weekend's activities to his memory. Turning to this evening's main event, I am pleased to introduce Professor William Jacobson. Professor Jacobson is Clinical Professor of Law and Director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. Prior to joining the Cornell Law faculty in 2007, Professor Jacobson had a highly successful civil litigation and arbitration practice in Providence, Rhode Island, concentrating in investment, employment, and business disputes in the securities industry, including many high-profile cases reported in leading newspapers and magazines. Professor Jacobson has argued cases in numerous federal and state courts, including the courts of appeals of the First, Fifth, and Sixth Circuits, and the Rhode Island Supreme Court. He is a graduate of Hamilton College and Harvard Law School. In 2008, Professor Jacobson founded the Legal Insurrection website, which has become one of the most influential conservative websites, frequently quoted and linked not only in conservative media, but also mainstream media. Professor Jacobson frequently appears as a guest on radio and television, including recent appearances on the Tucker Carlson and Shannon Bream shows. Professor Jacobson lectures on campuses and before community groups on issues related to free speech and how the call-out and cancel cultures have moved from campus to the broader culture. In March 2019, Professor Jacobson launched the Legal Insurrection Foundation, a nonprofit research and investigative group focused on the so-called intersectional left, the crossover among various purported social justice groups that are driving both campus and non-campus politics. Covering the trial of the Gibson's Bakery v. Oberlin College case was the first major project of the Legal Insurrection Foundation which was the only national media outlet to have a reporter in the courtroom every day of the seven-week trial. That trial coverage earned legal insurrection tremendous praise and attention. And so it is in that vein, and I'll end on a personal note, that I first came across the work of Professor Jacobson. He penned an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on the Gibsons case in June. Reading the account of the case he provided, I was incredulous. Over breakfast that morning, when I read the op-ed, I pointed out uh, Professor Jacobson's um, entry uh, to my wife, Megan. Her eyes lit up. William Jacobson? That was my securities clinic professor at Cornell. <laughs> and so it was at that point I, and later Professor Argus, knew we would have to bring Professor Jacobson in with us. So it is an added special treat to have my wife here tonight rekindling an old connection with her former professor. Will everyone please join me in welcoming Professor William Jacobson? Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate that. I'm glad we have a great turnout. I'd like to think. Hopefully it picks up better now. No? How is that? Is that better? OK, good. Well, thank you for that introduction. I'd like to think everybody is here because of me, but I know it's because you were hoping for Gibson Bakery cookies, and we didn't disappoint. <laughs> uh, 
So seriously, thank you all for coming out. Um, I appreciate it. The uh, and small world that um, Garrett's wife was my student. She also, it's a smaller world, she lives in the town next to me in Rhode Island. So we're both Rhode Islanders. Um, as Megan would recall, one of the questions I frequently ask students as we embark in either a new project or an interview of somebody to ask themselves, what are we doing here? What's the plan? So I'll tell you what I'm doing here. Um, I don't consider it my job tonight to argue for or against the outcome of the case. Um, I do think it was a just and fair result. Whether it was a lawful result will be up to some appellate court judges. Um, my goal tonight is to try to create an understanding, not just why the jury ruled as it did, but if there is something bigger, a bigger picture here that perhaps has not been picked up. Is this case m more than just about a shoplifting incident gone bad, protest boycotts and defamatory leaflets, a trial and a verdict? My conclusion is that if you want to understand what happened in this trial, in this case, you have to understand the history of identity politics and social justice warfare at Oberlin College and the administration's historic, historical reaction to that and participation in that. The shoplifting and the campus reaction did not take place in a vacuum. Oberlin students, faculty, and administrators reacted the way they did in a context of identity politics, which presumed that a local white business owner stopping a black student for shoplifting was racial profiling. But throughout this, whether it's the incident, the protests, or the case, Oberlin College's history of identity politics and social justice warfare was the elephant in the room, including at trial where it became a big issue and was argued by the plaintiffs to be one of the motivations for the administration acting the way that it did. It was the college's inability or unwillingness to speak truth to student power that would end up being the focal point of the trial and the focal point of the closing statements by the plaintiff's lawyers. One thing that's interesting here in this context is that Oberlin College sought a change of venue to move the case out of its home county. Think about that. They did not believe they could get a fair trial in their home county. Um, the plaintiffs made the case, or tried to make the case, that the Oberlin College administration became enablers and participants in the actions that the students did. That enabling and participation legally ran head into standard principles of corporate liability for the actions of corporate officers and employees. And the question would be whether this case is somewhat unique in that the administration of the college, the senior officers, were argued to be not just officers of the college, but the actual perpetrators and participants in the events. Um, there were a number of things that came out during the trial that focused on that issue of participation. One was in an internal email by the Dean of Students, which talked about supporting the students in their protest. And there was a lot of trial testimony and a lot of arguing in front of the jury. What does support mean? Does support mean support or does it mean something else? There also was a text message that came out and was featured very prominently at the trial. And it was a text me message some months after the events when a professor uh, emeritus at the college wrote an op-ed criticizing the administration and I can see some people smiling. You may know what's coming. Uh, I'll use abbreviations. And basically, the dean of students responded to somebody that if she didn't want this to get behind the college, she'd say, I'd unleash the students on him. And that concept of supporting, unleashing the students, the ability to control the students would become very uh, important and would cover over it, and I'll get into some more of the evidence about that. So why did I focus on this? That's the question. 
Some people think I'm obsessed with Oberlin. I'm really not. It's just from a website point of view, historically has presented a lot of low-hanging news fruit um, for us to cover. <laughs> and so it's easy. Um, my first, but some of that low-hanging fruit is actually, uh, I think, bears directly. The first major Oberlin College event that I covered, at least that I have a record of covering, was what I've called the Great Racism Hoax of 2013. In February and early March 2013, uh, openly racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, a lot of other things, posters were put around campus, flyers. The campus erupted, the classes were canceled so they could have community meetings. There were sightings of somebody it was such a frenzy that a student reported seeing someone walking at night in a Klan robe. Um, the best evidence is that it was a student who had wrapped herself in a blanket to protect herself from the cold who was walking at night. But that was the atmosphere on campus. People were seeing things that probably were not there. Um, but something that struck me about it was not just the leaflets and the posters put around campus. It was the administrative reaction to that. And I would follow this story for almost a year. And one thing that was curious is that soon after it happened, the, there were reports attributable to the Oberlin Town Police that two students had been identified, but there was some doubt as to their motivations. And that struck me as, well, what do you mean doubt as to their motivations? Look at the posters. Um, and then the administration at the college was being very coy about it. And I reached out to their spokesperson multiple times. And when asked directly whether there was a possibility that this was a hoax, that it was somebody doing it for a reason other than because they're racist, um, the administration said they can't speak to the motive behind the, the writings. But they knew who the students were. They refused to confirm that the acts were motivated by racism, not a hoax. Uh, and I asked them that directly, uh, repeatedly. And um, then it was reported several weeks later in early May that the two students were two white male students. But again, they would not comment on who they were or what their motivations were or whether this was, in fact, a hoax. Throughout this time period, with the encouragement of the university, of the college administration, um, in order to focus the students, there were workshops held around campus to come up with proposals, working groups, on how to fight racism on campus as a result of what had happened in late February and early March. And those workshops and those working groups um, did bear fruition. And there were um, many, many proposals that they made that I'll go into that were ultimately accepted. But then in August, something interesting happened. It was discovered by the Daily Caller that the two students had done this not because they were racist, but because they wanted to start a conversation on campus. One of them was a white liberal student, and that was when the Daily Caller got him on the phone. That was his explanation. I wanted us to talk about racism on campus. And based on the police records that I obtained and other media obtained, it was very clear that the college administration knew about this all the way back to February, but they never told the campus, and they allowed these working groups to come up with proposals as to how to change the campus, knowing that it was a hoax. It was a hoax not in the sense, I mean, the posters were what they were, but there's a big difference. If the president of the college had come out and said, hold on, this was somebody trying to spark a conversation, not a hidden Klansman on campus, not somebody saying this, we still condemn it, it shouldn't have been done, but the motivation would make a difference. And this was something that the administration clearly knew and clearly uh, enabled. Uh, so it never informed the student body or the media that was covering it. So you had a narrative created about racism on campus, you had working groups created to come up with proposals, and those proposals were largely accepted. The proposals had to deal 
with reorientation of incoming freshmen and faculty. Um, they included revised, and these are the ones that were accepted. There were other proposals, um, particularly as to faculty that were not accepted because faculty have their academic freedom, but uh, revising the new student orientation materials, including mandatory orientation programs led by the Multicultural Resource Center, extending discussions of social justice and allyship during new student orientation, uh, including in those discussions of social justice and allyship in multiple required sessions of new faculty orientation, enhancing the Multicultural Resource Center budget, identifying new, evidence, uh, new efforts for staff diversity, recruitment and retention, and the building of social justice capacity among faculty and staff in each division. And I'm not going to be exhaustive and go through everything. As to the athletic department, the accepted changes were increasing participation of coaches and athletic staff in social justice events. And as to the natural sciences, um, also embracing these various diversity initiatives. So what you had here play out was a hoax that the administration knew was a hoax, but, a la but redirected the anger from the administration into workshops as to how to change things on campus, knowing that the premise was faulty, what had sparked it. And so there was a participation, if you will, uh, by the administration in what had happened on campus. Uh, events continued to percolate at Oberlin. There was a fairly famous 14-page list of demands signed by a variety of groups on campus, presented to the administration. It's a document that we obtained um, first, and it is the number one view document we have on Scribd. I think it's approaching 200,000 views. Um, and uh, the demand list um, included uh, a 4% annual increase in the enrollment of black students in the jazz department, and I'm not going to go through all of them. It's 14, it's 14 pages, okay? <laughs> um, that all black international students who are unable to return to their home countries be provided with free housing during break, um, financial aid workshops, uh, structural changes in institutional graduation requirements, and that Western, that mandatory requirements of Western classical centered courses must be eliminated, or if not, then all students must also take an equivalent discourse in the African diaspora. Um, professional, mandatory professional development programs from the faculty, um, et cetera, et cetera. They also demanded that certain professors be elevated to tenure and that other professors be fired. Um, the good news is that the president did not accept the 14-page list. The bad news is that rather than saying to the students, essentially, you have no idea what you're talking about. This is ridiculous. He rejected on the grounds that they had simply presented him with a demand list and had not worked in a cooperative fashion. Of course, he did say, as to faculty, we can't hire and fire people, like you say. Um, so he say, um, I will not respond to any document that explicitly rejects the notion of collaborative engagement. So the fact that these were demands was the focus of the rejection, not the substance of the demands. Um, many of the demands contravene principles of shared governance. That would have to do with faculty. Uh, and also included personal attacks on faculty and staff members. So it was a fairly muted response. The good news was the, none of them were rejected. The bad news was it was something of a capitulation because the president missed an opportunity to explain more, in more detail why you know, we can't have racial hiring quotas. We can't do a lot of these things. They're actually illegal. Um, and so uh, that was missed. It. There were other high-profile incidents at Oberlin. Um, a lot of them centered around food. Okay. 
and food and cultural appropriation issues. Uh, talk about first world problems, okay? Um, there was the Vietnamese sandwich that was apparently had improper ingredients. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm not going to try because I don't want to be accused of cultural misappropriation. Um, there was a very bizarre, that's all I can call it, very bizarre demand um, from the Black Student Union who protested that the Africana House Dining Hall did not regularly serve fried chicken. They actually had protests over this. Um, then there was the infamous General so Tso's chicken, um, which I don't claim to be a you know, connoisseur of these things, but I don't think is actually an Asian dish. <laughs> I believe it's an Americanized version of what somebody thinks is an Asian dish. But nonetheless, uh, and I'll quote you, um, instead of deep fried chicken with ginger garlic soy sauce, sauce, the chicken was steamed with a substitute sauce. Now, you would think the administration would tell them to go pound sand, okay? But no, actually the director of dining services ended up apologizing. We recently fell short in the execution of several dishes in a manner that was culturally insensitive. <laughs> now you know why I cover Oberlin so much. <laughs> um, but there's a serious angle to this. You have a long history of an, a weak administration which appears to be fearful of the students and reacts like it's fearful of the students and tries to redirect, when it can, student anger towards something else other than the administration. There's another thing going on here, which is a fairly shocking history of uh, shoplifting by Oberlin College students, not just at Gibson's Bakery, but throughout the town. A student, after the Gibson's Bakery incident, wrote in a student journal, student publication, um, an article called The Culture of Theft. And in it, they investigated, they spoke to a lot of students. And we st to start, we uncovered a sad truth that the majority of shoplifting in Oberlin is carried out by students. And most of the explanations they got from students was they did it because they felt like it. Uh, and the administration was aware of this shoplifting problem. I think that is very clear, the evidence of that, and chose not to do much about it. Uh, I don't want to fast forward too much, but that would become an issue in the trial because David Gibson, the person who really ran the bakery day to day, um, testified that when he went to the administration to see if it could be resolved, one of the things they demanded was that for student shoplifting, that the college administrators be called, not the police. The college denies that. That's why you have a trial. Two people testify differently. But that became an issue. David Gibson was quoted um, in the Cleveland Plain Dealer as saying, we had, have a huge problem with shoplifting. We did an examination last year and found that more than 1,000 items had been stolen through shoplifting. We found empty boxes on the shelves and many missing items. We had to crack down on shoplifting if we are going to be able to survive as a store. So you have a number of events converging here a weak administration, student activists who are very quick to make accusations and demands regarding racism and other things, and a real problem with shoplifting in the town of Oberlin. And there were news reports about others who interviewed other store owners who just spoke about this shoplifting problem being out of control. And a student had the guts to write about it in a student journal, what he called the culture of theft at Oberlin College. But we're not done setting the scene for what happened. Um, the shoplifting at issue took place on November 9, 2016. Who knows what day that was? Mm, that was the day after Donald Trump was elected, unless you consider him elected at 3 in the morning, in which it was the same day. But it was the day after Election Day. And as you can imagine, and I'm going to quote the student newspaper, 
Waves of fear and shock spread across campus Tuesday night as an unlikely reality set in. Donald Trump is going to be America's next president. More than 300 students attended an election watch party, many of whom sat in tearful silence with heads, head in hands as Trump won every crucial battleground state. As the students exited this event, um, returning home, the students exited returning home distraught, some loudly commenting, the world is going to end tomorrow. <laughs> My belief is that had this shoplifting incident took, taken place on some other day, if it had taken place the week before or a month later, I don't know if I'd be standing in front of you. But it was this confluence of things. And that's what makes this such an interesting and unique case. Um, what happened is the ob that uh, whether there was, in fact, um, a history of profiling at the bakery, um, and the Oberlin police ran their statistics on it, and they had no reason to suspect that the arrests at Gibson's over the years were racially motivated, but they went back and they looked at it. And this was reported pretty quickly in the local paper. Uh, quoting the police chief, we looked at arrests for shoplifting at Gibson's for the past five years to see if there was evidence of racism. Since 2011, there have been four robberies at the store, including the student in question. They called shoplifting a robbery for whatever their reason. Um, so including this incident, there were four, um, but he, this person was the only black person arrested for the shoplifting. Um, there were 40 adults arrested for shoplifting in five years, 32 were white. So there was no evidence. And actually, if you take those numbers and turn them into percentages, it's actually very closely mirrors the Oberlin community. So there was no statistical evidence of that. And Gibson's, this tiny little bakery in Minimart, had the largest number of shoplifting cases in the city right after Walmart. So this was a real problem. There were protests outside the bakery. They were um, attended by senior administrators, including the dean of students. It's undisputed that she was there. What she did when she was there was disputed. But there were flyers passed out that became the key basis for the defamation claim. And the judge went through a very careful analysis on summary judgment. Throughout a number of the defamation claims, Found, finding they were constitutionally protected speech, uh, including by faculty on, fa on faculty Facebook pages, things like that, but found two documents that were defamatory in the judge's estimation. One, and the key one in the focus of the trial, was a flyer handed out which accused Gibsons of having a, quote, long account of racial profiling and discrimination, and also accused them of assaulting the, uh, the black student. Uh, the judge went through, like I said, an extended explanation as to why he felt those were not constitutionally protected opinion, um, because they suggested facts known to the person speaking that would authenticate it and would make it provable or non-provable. Uh, but that's going to be a big issue for appeal. Uh, one witness testified uh, that the dean of students was leading the protest on a bullhorn and was passing out stacks of these defamatory flyers. She denies that. College's position has always been she only spoke for two minutes on the bullhorn and she only gave one flyer to a reporter who asked her for it. But there were multiple witnesses who testified otherwise. Jury gets to decide who to believe, who not to believe. But that was the testimony by one of the witnesses. Um, there was another witness who saw the uh, assistant director of the college's multicultural resource center also distributing the defamatory flyers um, and handing out stacks of them. Uh, a witness testified that among the things said on the bullhorn, and his testimony was that she was leading it, not just uh, briefly addressing the cloud, but among the things were she directed people where they could go 
to make copies of the flyers. So you have a, what was alleged to be a participation by the administration. There also was a student Senate resolution making similar accusations. And I think the evidence is a lot less extensive there as to what made that being published by the college. But there was testimony that it was on a college controlled board in the building for a year after it was known that this was not racial profiling um, and that the college lent assistance to the students in pushing that out to the community. Bakery sued, asserted eight different claims, most of which did not make it to trial. They were either thrown out by the judge or dropped at the opening of trial. As you know, sometimes lawyers will say, well, maybe technically I can present this case, but it's weak, so let's not water down the good claims with the weak claims. So what ended up happening is the judge on summary judgment allowed those defamation claims to go forward. Um, but one thing that struck me in Gibson's, uh, in Oberlin's whole defense, from the very time they filed the answer on December 13, 2007, is how aggressive they were in attacking the bakery. How they portrayed themselves as the victim of the bakery and accused the bakery of manip trying to manipulate things. Um, and that really struck me as strange. Um, quoting from the answer, a little argumentative for an answer, but I guess they figured this all gets into the paper, so it's your chance to make your statement. By filing this lawsuit, plaintiffs regrettably are attempting to prof profit from a divisive and polarizing event that impacted Oberlin College, its students, and the Oberlin community. Not talking, of course, about how it impacted the bakery. Bakery lost a ton of business. College suspended purchases through their food service for a while. The college community boycotted the bakery. They're still doing that. Bakery's business has suffered tremendously. Um, and the, uh, I commented when I saw that approach that Thus, Oberlin and Raimondo seek to portray the college as the victim in this scenario. I can't imagine, based on what's publicly available, that this will work. And it didn't work. I mean, one of the strange things about this case is how short-sighted, how um, tone-deaf Oberlin College's defense was. Like I said, they made it past summary judgment. Um, Oberlin continued to defend and attack the bakery very vigorously. It was an extremely hard-fought case. Uh, it came out in post-trial motions for attorney's fees uh, by the Gibsons that Oberlin College or its insurer, we don't know, spent $5 million defending this case. The docket, the court docket, each page of which has 20-plus entries, is 23 pages long. Motion after motion, everything was fought, a really uh, bitter fight. And uh, so the judge went through his analysis, this went to trial. Like I said, we, we, I, I sensed that something was up here. We had a reporter in the room uh, throughout the trial, what I thought would be two to three weeks, ended up being seven weeks, and I'm like dying here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're begging somebody, and it's never ending. <laughs> and nobody's paying attention except us and our readers getting no media coverage. It's got some local media coverage, and local media had somebody in the courtroom, but no national coverage whatsoever. Uh, the person we hired, who's a, a fairly well-known uh, freelance journalist, said he had pitched this to numerous major media organizations and was basically told, look, we don't have money to have somebody sit in a courtroom in Ohio for who knows how long. Um, but it was our first project at the Legal Insurrection Foundation. The law given to the jury by the judge was pretty plain vanilla in terms of responsibility for the uh, actions of employees, and I think that's very important. The jury was specifically instructed that the Gibsons were seeking damages for the actions of employees of Oberlin College, not for the actions of the students. Because after the verdicts, Oberlin has tried to portray this as a case of Oberlin College being held liable for student speech. And they say that is very dangerous precedent to set because if colleges can be held liable for student speech, then they would have an incentive to stifle and quiet student speech. But in fact, that is not what the case is about. 
the case as I've recited to you is about whether Oberlin College's senior officer conduct constituted a tort for which under standard corporate liability principles, the corporation would be liable for. Now whether they should be liable, that's a different story. But the theory presented was that it was the actions of the senior officers that were responsible for this. Um, the verdict came down for $11 million. And everybody's shocked. Now everybody's paying attention. But if you'd been reading our website, which I hope you'll all do after tonight if you haven't already, uh, you would know because we would get a report every night. We would have a write-up of what happened that day, including how the jurors were like shaking their heads in disbelief at some of the defenses and some of the testimony trying to explain away. Well, support doesn't really mean support. Okay? Um, or, well, you know, I didn't really mean we'd unleash the students on people we don't like. Uh, and, and, uh, and they did something extraordinarily foolish. They called an expert, Oberlin College, to value the business. Uh, the va they valued the business at $35,000, the cost of a single semester at Oberlin. Talk about tone deaf. I mean, this is a business that is in its fifth generation at the time was supporting three of those five generations, had almost 10 local employees earning their livelihood from it, and to come in and say it's worth $35,000, and that if you find for the plaintiff, you should award $35,000, was so offensive on its face that I do believe the jury was very upset. I mean, I can't read their minds, and I don't know what that means on appeal, but it was offensive, the defense here, and I think perhaps drove home the callous disregard. So the $11, the $11 million verdict comes down, and in Ohio, it's bifurcated trial under Republican tort reform. If the defense requests it, you can bifurcate compensatory and punitive, theory being you don't get to present the somewhat nasty evidence as to character and motive during compensatory because motive shouldn't make a difference. In, in most cases. Um, so the 11 million comes down, and what does Oberlin immediately do? They send a blast email to the entire community regretting that the jury did not agree with the clear evidence our team presented. <laughs> so it's, talk about tone deaf. They're not getting it. They're attacking the jury, which still has to sit on the punitive damage phase. <laughs> So they go to punitive damages, and the defense tried to introduce that email. The judge would not allow it. But they managed to get kind of through the back door questioning, sort of a hint at it. Um, then the $33 million verdict comes down for punitive damages. And now everybody's paying attention to it. Now it's panic time. And that ends up getting reduced to 44 million. I'm using round numbers, but they're close round numbers. The 44 million dollars ends up getting reduced to 25 million dollars under Republican tort reform, which capped multiples of punitive damages and capped damages for non-economic uh, harm, uh, essentially emotional distress. So the, one of the ironies of this case is that ultra-liberal Oberlin College availed itself of Republican tort reform. <laughs> and it may end up saving them a lot of money. Uh, there were other damage theories that the defense, the plaintiffs were not allowed to portray. They wanted to uh, portray a, for defamation, a restorative. What would it cost to embark on a public relations campaign to restore the reputation? And that was a big number, according to the plaintiffs, $13 million. They were not allowed to present that to the jury. So I don't want anybody to get the case that this is a case where the um, judge just allowed it all in. There was no, I mean, very few of the claims made actually made it to the jury. A lot of evidence was excluded that the plaintiffs wanted to present. Uh, nonetheless, the jury came up with this result. Um, and where we are now is that Gibson, um, sorry, Oberlin College is on a full blown public relations campaign to portray this as a First Amendment case and to portray this as being held liable for student speech. And um, that's their story and they're sticking to it. Uh, I don't believe it's an accurate story. I think the 
the record is clear. Whether they should have, whether this was defamation is one question. But if it was defamation, it was defamation by the dean of students, the senior vice president of the corporation for which they were held liable, um, not by the students. Um, they've never sued the students. Makes sense. You're going to chase 19-year-olds who probably have no money. So even if they had technically claims against them, it's just not something you would choose to do. Um, where we are now is that Oberlin College has hired additional lawyers, including some First Amendment lawyers from DC, uh, who are going to pursue the appeal for them. Gibson's Bakery has counter-appealed what they called a um, contingent cross-appeal, um, where they are requesting that the punitive and other damage caps be declared unconstitutional, violation of the Ohio Constitution, and they want their $44 million restored. Um, and that's where we are. Uh, sad note, um, David Gibson, the main person running the bakery, uh, released a video a month or two ago indicating that he had pancreatic, pancreatic cancer, that that fact has been known to Oberlin College for a long time. And Oberlin College actually obtained an order that I didn't know about prohibiting them from disclosing that during the case or publicly um, because they felt that would, might sway the jury. Um, and so Oberlin's known about it for a long time. And he said that his belief is that Oberlin College is trying to wake him and his father out. His father's 92. He's in his 60s with pancreatic cancer. And they're just waiting them out. Um, whether that is their motivation or not, I don't know. A lot of the things Oberlin College has done in this case has baffled me. But I think to understand it, you have to understand the history. The president, of, the current president of Oberlin College is not the person who was the president when this took place. And when they appointed a new president, my thinking was, and my writing was, perfect chance to clear things up. It's somebody else's problem that I have inherited. Maybe we shouldn't be paying them a lot of money, but we're going to do it because we need to put this behind us. We need a fresh start. But that has been the opposite. If anything, they are more aggressive now in attacking the bakery than they ever were. With that, I think I'm approaching my time target, uh, and I think we're going to have some questions. So thank you very much. back memories of Amherst. <laughs> uh, 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 the night of the day after the election, uh, the president of the college. Uh, pres I'm sorry, can you hear me? Oh, this is supposed to be on. Is that yeah. not working? No, no, you may want to move it closer to you. Oh, of course, move it up. He does that a lot. <laughs> This better? Yes. All right. I think that's better. Well, the president of the college put out a letter the next morning saying the students are understandably upset about the outcome of the election. The assumption that we'll all be upset about the outcome. And of course, they should have ample time to make up work, and you'll be understand that they, they feel compelled to miss classes uh, <laughs> since they're overcome with the uh, effects of the, the time. But this, this record of a senior faculty just caving in, being utterly credulous and submissive. I mean, this goes back 50 years now to the, uh, in, remember at Amherst, the classes were called off in 69 and then 70 for Cambodia Spring. And, and Dan Robinson used to say, yeah, education is something we do here until something better comes along. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then we call off classes and get to it. Because um, I, I guess people would want to know how, how much is, is Oberlin has the, the um, has the, the Gibson family been spending for, uh, for legal help? What have their bills been? On they this? hired um, a very well-known Ohio tort lawyer who has it on contingency fee. Um, I believe the law firms have been advancing the costs, which have been in the several hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the time records for the 
plaintiff's lawyers, because as many here will know, when you're on contingency fee, if you think you're going to have to make a fee application, so you keep your hourly record. The, just as Oberlin College's fees were about $5 million hourly, so were the plaintiff's lawyers. And this was a very funny thing that played out in the court, is that Oberlin College didn't want their fee records to come into evidence, certainly not the quantities, and the judge agreed with the plaintiffs, well, no, actually, you both tried the same case, and the Oberlin College hours into it are one measure of giving credibility and reasonableness to the hours the plaintiff's lawyers put into it. The judge gave uh, most of the hours the claimant, the plaintiff's lawyers requested, but not all of them, did knock some of them down, and then gave a 1.5 lodestar multiplier. Turned out a $6.5 million attorney fee award to the bakery. So you have the $25 million judgment on the the merits, and then you have $6.5 million of attorney's fees, rounded up to $32 million. Gibson, uh, Oberlin College has posted a $36 million appeal bond to prevent execution on the judgment pending appeal. So they, they have not paid. There's no way they could pay. I have readers who have stopped by the Gibson Bakery when they're passing through where they make a detour to go there <laughs> when they're in Ohio. Um, and from what they tell me, the store shelves are not very well stocked. Uh, and I have heard other reports from people, not from the Gibsons, but from other people who should know that um, they're really struggling. I mean, think about it. They are in a college town, and the college community is still boycotting them. Maybe not officially, but students won't shop there. Faculty aren't shopping there. The administration's not shopping there. They're not getting business from the college. That was suspended for several months, then put back in place, and then when they sued, suspended again. Uh, and the, uh, it's a real struggle. Imagine you had a bakery in D.C., and nobody who worked for the federal government or their families would shop at your bakery. How are you going to survive? And it's probably worse in Oberlin in terms of the weight that Oberlin College plays. So they're, they're not doing well from what I've heard. So the sense is that there's this informal mechanism is still working, that, 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 that yes. members of the faculty would feel sheepish in, in running against the current of opinion of, among the, their colleagues. That, that's the, the prevailing view, and that's what people have told me, that there is still an unofficial boycott of Gibsons. And the student newspaper, by the way, has been completely supportive of the administration. There of don't course. seem to be many dissenting voices at Oberlin, other than from some alums. There is no surprise in this notion that a succession of administrations has not made a difference because it's the, the orthodoxy now of the administration and it's, it's their truth. It's yeah. their truth see, that, that's on the line. And, and did, our friends at the American Council of Trustees and Alumni have just put an interesting study showing that the, well, these colleges are more swollen administration now as my, my place was. And that the, the administrator, the administrator's staff, is far more tilted to the left than the faculty's been. And the remedy being offered here is enlarging the diversity of administrators and just adding to the people who are the source of the problem. Uh, let me ask you one question before we, we I, I went, but there must be lots of questions out here for you. Uh, going, going back to Henry Hyde, a number of our friends have worried about the imbalance on the campus and wonder whether is there anything the federal government could do to uh, uh, go to the aid of conservatives who are uh, 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 outnumbered in these instances? But there's an asymmetry, a part of the First Amendment problem here. Aramis College, a private entity, goes, well, they, they could require everybody to speak Latin, bounce on one foot. Uh, yeah, we could be repressive. It's a private entity. And if we sought to offset that arrangement, with the law acting here to sort of you know, make some effort to, to hire conservatives. The, the arm would be made that you're putting up political screens and you're punishing some people on, for, for, the sake, for, for their opinions. But now the restriction is coming not from a private entity, but from the law. The law is imposing those restrictions, which gets, there's an asymmetry here. What, but now, you must have thought, the question must have arisen about what can be done Practically, a number of people have been, been urging us to try to do something to try to 
uh, offset this imbalance. Did any, any ideas come to you? Any thoughts on this matter, Bill? Well, it is something that I've thought about and been asked a lot and spoken about, and I don't think there is an, a quick fix. I don't think legislation is going to be a quick fix because I think the problem on campuses is a cultural problem, um, and it's very hard to change the culture. It's been 50 years coming. Um, I just look at my own trajectory and students when I was at Harvard Law School in the early 80s who were activist students uh, all went into academia and the other students went into law and business and we may have done better financially but they had our kids for 30 years and I think so it, it's a cultural problem what I think the best short-term answer is is to go around the faculty to present educational opportunities to students. There's, uh, I went to Hamilton College. There's a very interesting history oh, sure. of how the faculty was taken over. So when I started, it was all male Hamilton conservative college, kind of 60-ish Kirkland College. It was actually a good mix, uh -huh. two separate campuses, but right across the road from each other. Um, Kirkland went out of business. It got absorbed by Hamilton. Its radical faculty got absorbed by Hamilton. And over the next 25 years, they took over the key committees. They hired people who thought like them. And they took over the, the faculty. And the faculty at Hamilton now is indistinguishable from the faculty at Oberlin and many other places. Sure. But an interesting ha thing happened. A couple of the older professors who were upset with what was happening on campus got funding, 100% funding. Would not have cost Hamilton a penny to build a center for the study of Western civilization on Hamilton's campus. Completely funded, not just the building, but staffing everything. Hamilton administration said, great, great idea. The faculty revolted against it, and the administration backed down. So they would not allow a fully funded. So what did the Alexander Hamilton um, Center, I think it's called, Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization do. They located off campus. They bought a building off campus, and Hamilton's on a hill, so it's down at the bottom of the hill. They bought the old Alexander Hamilton Inn, uh, and they now run classes for students, and they have enormous participation. I think they have, in any given semester, 100 or 150 students participating in their classes. Not for credit, I don't think they charge anybody, but right. they're providing an alternative education for people. And I think there is a real hunger for students. And I've had some experiences, we don't have time tonight, when I've given lectures places. There is a real hunger on students to be taught about the foundations of Western civilization, not from the politicized left-wing point of view, but from a more traditional point of view. But somebody's got to present it to them and give them those opportunities. This is what uh, Robbie Joyce has been doing. With his, uh, the, he's had the, the, the funds to fund these um, satellite programs at Penn, Berkeley, Harvard, all over. We had this same thing at Amherst. We, had, we could raise a lot of money from the alumni and the president, but, but the, the, the opposition within the fa faculty was uh, that we had these two different things. Robbie George and I began these programs at the same time. But the people at Owen thought, oh, this could succeed at Princeton because it's a porous place. You could plunk down an institute here and it doesn't threaten anyone else, but a place that is tightly controlled by its faculty represents an entirely different problem. Which is why they should have done it at that place. Exactly. exactly. We, could, we could have done it, but um, perhaps we could maybe go, maybe go back to that other scheme again. Well, let's open up to, to questions, okay? Uh, David, we have an Ohio yeah. contingent and people. Yeah, if you can just wait for the microphone, we'll, we'll pass it on over to you and then um, uh, you can make sure that your question is recorded um, as well. We have a distinguished audience for you today also. Okay. David Ford. Thanks for a great, great talk. Uh, uh, you said that Hobel is appealing <clears throat> on the basis of one of their claims as a First Amendment claim. Um, who, who's representing them? Is it? Uh, big firm, and two, uh, uh, following that, does the, does, has Gibson, uh, Gibson's lawyer called upon resources, uh, First Amendment resources from the conservative side uh, to fight this? Uh, 
As to Gibson's lawyers, I have no idea what they've done, if they have done that or have not done that. Certainly it would be advisable for them to do that. Um, from the uh, Oberlin, the names were released. It's a DC law firm. Names meant nothing to me. <laughs> They're apparently very big in their field. I just can't remember them, but they hired, specifically on the First Amendment issue, they hired uh, two lawyers at a Washington branch of a big national law firm. I'm just blanking out on the name of it. And they've also hired new appellate lawyers for the uh, Cleveland, for the Ohio State Court part of it. How many lawyers does it take to, <laughs> to file an appeal? <laughs> Apparently, the pre existing dozen plus six to seven more. Um, but yes, so, uh, but I don't know if the Gibson's lawyers, I would, they should, they really, they really should. If they have uh, one follow up. How much of this uh, expense on Oberlin's part is covered by their endowment and how much by insurance? That's an unknown. I know that one of the insurers filed a motion in court to intervene mm. um, because they wanted to intervene for the purpose of submitting proposed jury <coughs> interrogatories, which would help clarify whether this would be covered by Oberlin's insurance. Um, the judge rejected that. Um, and there was an indication in the papers that they filed that they, there was a possibility they would be disclaiming coverage because these were intentional torts that were alleged. So they wanted very specific questions to sort that out, and they were not allowed to. So that tells me they have insurance. My guess, and it's just a guess, is that the insurance companies have been paying for the defense because typically the obligation to defend is broader than the obligation to indemnify. So my guess is that the insurance companies, but I have no way of knowing that. Uh, one of the things that Oberlin, this was almost laughable, Oberlin made a pitch to the jury that if they awarded too much money, it would negatively impact the student's edu education because most of their $800 million endowment is restricted. They can't use it. And they said that basically the most they could come up with is $50 million. Oh. Think about that. Oh. Okay. I'm not the most genius yeah. strategist. <laughs> if you're going to tell the jury you can afford $50 million, are you surprised when they come back with $44? <laughs> <laughs> Bill, why, why, do, why, why do you think the judge rejected the interrogatory? I, I don't know, and there weren't specific interrogatories. This was not a general verdict. There were, were 20 pages of jury interrogatories, and I don't know whether how closely they tracked, but I, I don't, I mean, the judge gave an opinion, wrote a, a memorandum why he was rejecting it, um, but he did, he did but, not. But at that moment, the interest of the insurance company was adverse to the interest of the college, I take it. They're trying uh, to that's right, the, they're, the they're insurance trying, company They're wanted, trying to get off the hook. Exactly, the insurance company was not doing this, and it was very interesting because throughout their papers they talk about the reason they need to intervene is the lack of cooperation of the college. Because you're right, they wanted jury interrogatories to prove that they didn't have to cover this. You know, is it with, you know, this matter of the contrived, in, I think most of these incidents have been contrived. We had a famous incident of a cross burning at Amherst years ago, and, um, and we spent two days in self-flagellation and so on. I remember I raised the question to the president of the college, uh, what if the people who burned the crosses claim this is a First Amendment right because some of our friends in the courts are willing to defend the freedom to burn crosses? And the president said, oh, no, that would never stand here. And then it was discovered that it was the black students themselves who had burned the crosses. And now they wanted to call off the prosecution. Call off it. But no, they, it's, it's too late. They had already given me my answer that, of course, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't surrender it. But remember, it's, it's, we had a gal from, I was a telling moment, a gal from Westchester, a student, in response to this contrived case, said, you see what we made them do. So powerless are they. 
And I thought it confirmed Herman Kahn's sense that higher education is now rendering our students imbecilic. <laughs> that, that you know, so I was, this, this started me go, going doing some Damon Runyon pieces for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, how would this, how would somebody, uh, Dennis, those, those people on Broadway who didn't have the disadvantage of a college education react to this? Nathan Detroit. Nathan, you see what we made them do? <laughs> so on. Well, you know, one, again, one of the theories presented to the jury by the plaintiffs was that the participation and that this was controlled by the college administration specifically to turn the student anger away from the college administrators and towards the bakery. And that this was a weak administration which was trying to protect itself by defaming and turning on this local bakery. But it's also affirming the premises of uh, gender identity. That if we were confirming the fact that we're, we're, in a, we're embedded in a racist society, so what else do you expect? This would be confirming our premises. But anyway, there are the, there are the questions out here. Yeah. Oh, uh, over there, and the, and, the, the, and the gentleman on the side. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so as a graduate of Cornell Law School, I'm curious, <clears throat> with your work with legal insurrection, what kind of support or pushback do you get from the faculty, uh, administration, and students at the law school itself? Ooh, good question. Yeah. So uh, Cornell has about 17,000 students. I think it's about 1,500 to 1,700 faculty. You can count on one hand the number of openly politically conservative professors, and I emphasize politically. The may be professors who consider themselves economically conservative, um, philosophically conservative, but they don't put themselves out there politically. Um, and of the five, um, clearly I am the most out there. Um, so I started my website on October 12th, 2008. By the end of October, the law school was already getting demands that I be fired. Um, that kept up for several years. Um, a lot of harassment, multiple attempts to get me fired, threats to boycott the law school if I wasn't fi fired, oh. harassment of other faculty because I was on the faculty. How dare you have this person? Um, and the interesting thing is, two interesting things. One, the deans always backed me up unequivocally and told me, do not worry about it. Both the dean who hired me and the current dean. The dean who hired me said to me once, you serve an invaluable function here. Whenever the alumni complain the faculty is too liberal, I get to point to you. <laughs> so I have no, you know, I will say every time I go to use my swipe card to get in, I do wonder for a split second, <laughs> is it going to work? <laughs> but it's been working now since 2008, um, and uh, 2007, but 2008 when I started the website. And it, and it continued for quite a while, and then it's like somebody blew a dog whistle that only the harassers heard, and it pretty much stopped um, three, four years ago. Um, but the administration's always backed me up. The uh, website is the elephant in every room I walk into at the law school, but everybody knows about it. A lot of people read it. No one has confronted me and criticized it on the faculty, but I hear you know back channel sort of things that you know nobody they don't like it. Some do, some don't, and that's okay. But nobody gives me a problem you know to my face. The students I've notice something, and a few other conservative faculty around the country have said the same thing, they've noticed too, purely anecdotal. But in the last couple of years, I've noticed something of backlash brewing among students to oh, the really? oppressive regimes they live under on campus. And I've noticed it with regard to my website because it used to be that students would not really talk about it in front of me. Maybe at the end of the semester they'd come up to me and I really like your website, my parents. <laughs> my, my parents told me about it. <laughs> my dad's a big fan. <laughs> um, but in the last couple of years, you know, I haven't quantified it. Students will talk about it openly in front of other students, things I've written there. So I've noticed it. Uh, my classes are always overbooked. 
by a multiple. So I've never, uh, I've never really had a problem within the law school, um, but, or even at the university, when people complain to the university president's office, they would just, you know, they send it to the dean and say, don't worry about it. So I, I have no problems with the way I've been treated there. And all of the pressure that I'm aware of has come from off campus. And the other interesting thing is, all the people who wanted me fired and sanctioned and this and that and the other, they weren't anarchists, they weren't communists, they were mainstream liberal Democrats who felt it was their right, and many of them using their own names, not even anonymous, um, to try to interfere in my employment. What would the, uh, we have another question, but just a quickie, a quickie though, what would their objection be? Because after all, you had not taken sides. You were simply documenting the day-by-day -day unfolding of this case of a small family business that had been a venerable institution in, in this town. It was, being, it was obviously being destroyed. Yeah. What was the, quote, liberal concern here? Yeah, let me be clear. The, the complaints were not about the Oberlin case co coverage. This is going back more to 2008 through 2012, 2013. Um, opposition to Obama, opposition to Obamacare, opposition to Elizabeth Warren. The most oh. vicious attacks I got were from an Elizabeth Warren supporter <clears throat> who emailed every single faculty member in the uh, building um, one by one, not a mass email, and tailored each email to that faculty member. So the minority faculty members got emails about how racist I am. Um, and the female faculty members got emails about how sexist I supposedly am, a very coordinated sort of thing. Um, and, you know, uh, and I didn't know that this was going on. And I was in a faculty meeting, and somebody I know came up to me and said, oh, I got a strange email about you. Uh, I said, okay, you know, send it to me. I like to know what's going on. And uh, she sends it to me, so I forwarded it to the dean. I said, uh, you know, you may, I I'm forwarding this to you because so-and-so got it. I just want to give you a heads up in case you get something or somebody else gets something like this. And he emails back and says, well, actually, everyone has got it. <laughs> and I said to some people, I said, why didn't you tell me? I'm like the only one in the whole building that doesn't know this is going on. And I believe the responses I got were good faith. They said we were embarrassed. We were embarrassed that somebody would think we're so shallow that we're going to terminate somebody because we disagree with them politically. I said, that's nice, but please tell me if these <laughs> things come in. <laughs> oh, I promised the question over there, and I see Jim wanted to get, get back in. Mm -hmm. Over here? So, were there any uh, political leaders in Oberlin who went to bat for Gibson's uh, if you don't? Uh, not that I know of. I don't think uh, this has, was under the radar from the political landscape. As far as I know, no congressmen or politicians have been involved at all in this. It's a little bit surprising. People I've spoken to locally take the view that they probably just view this as Oberlin being Oberlin, and no surprise. So, but it has not generated, it's generated a fair amount of publicity, and I know it's generated a lot of alumni interest, <coughs> and I know the school is worried about that, and they're on a campaign now to allay alumni fears about what's happening and to portray themselves as heroic defenders of student free speech. Um, and, uh, but I don't know of any political repercussion. And, and just one more question. The, there was a former president of Oberlin who I think uh, was critical of the way the current administration. Fred, Fred Stark. Yes. Fred Stark. Yes. And there's an op-ed piece that he wrote. And has there been a reaction to that that you're aware of? Not, not that I'm aware of now. Um, I saw that when it came out, and I researched him a little bit, and I think he's probably a good let. He probably, at least, I don't know what he would say, but I only know what I read. Um, students protested on the lawn of his house. Um, I forget what it was about, and that, but that got a lot of attention, and he be, fell out of favor with kind of the progressive movement on oh, campus. Yes. Oh, yes. And was targeted, and I think that probably sent a warning sign to future presidents that you don't want to rile up the students and you don't want them protesting on the lawn of your, of your house. He's a very tough, he's a very tough character. Yeah. One last question for Jim Morrison, Judge Morrison. 
Do any of your colleague faculty members who know you're not a racist bother to respond to the person who wrote them this nonsense? Not that I know of. Um, and if I were advising them, I would advise them not to respond. I never respond to these things because what they want is a reaction. And I never, and I kid you not, I've had people who will email me a nasty gram, and I don't respond. And they're not sure I got it because I haven't responded. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll send it to me again. And I had one person who after three or four times said, would you please let me know if you got this? <laughs> and I didn't respond. <laughs> But I, I don't respond, but I also don't pick up my office phone. Uh, and my staff is under, has been under strict instructions. I don't think it's been as necessary recently, but it, for years, do not tell anybody whether I'm in the office or not. Because there was a time that I got threat sufficient that campus security decided to send a detective to accompany me to graduation because they were afraid of disruptions. Um, so I've you know, it's just the way I live. But like I said, the last three to four years have been pretty quiet. Uh, but I still maintain this. Do not pick up the phone uh, unless you know who's calling. I can I sing from that response from your own defense. However, faculty members who won't even tell you about this, I think are acting like people used to say in the old days, my best friend is a black Jewish guy. I want to get all the minorities that I can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Be, but they don't have the courage to stand up and understand that their rights are every bit as much in peril as yours. I, I agree, and I think they should have told me about it. And I do think part of their thinking was, and I think it was good faith, whether it was correct or not, I don't know, but I think it was in good faith, is that what this guy wants us to do is to let you know about this. And that'll put pressure on you. Um, and so... I will also use this opportunity to pitch another website that I have called elizabethwarrenwiki.org. <laughs> um, it is a repository of the most extensive research um, anywhere about her, including research which led to uh, recent articles by the New York Times and Washington Post about her corporate law practice, uh, including about her Native American issue. I know this is a nonpartisan environment, uh, but it is very extensive, and I hope you will visit elizabethwarrenwiki.org. This, uh, this, this appeals to my prudent interest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, it actually, no, there's a resonance. I, I came into Amherst in the fall of 66 with a class of 70, and there was a remnant of that class that's been going around the chat rooms, the other classes, a couple of years trying to get me fired because of my opposition to same-sex marriage. It's been a rather vicious thing. Though, of course, the backers of this program, my former students, are from the class of 70. Uh, but they respond, oh, just don't answer. I, I want to answer. No, but they, they don't want to answer. But what comes back is that old line from my, my first leader, leader, the first Mayor Daly, who once said, I have been vilified. I've been crucified. I've even been Criticized. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Bill, thanks so much. That Thank was quite you. marvelous. Thank you. Before, before we depart, uh, a few uh, announcements and then a parting gift. First announcement is that uh, we're extraordinarily grateful for your time and your interest in our program. Uh, the James Wilson Institute. Um, in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be starting a, uh, an end of the year fundraising drive, and we, we would be grateful for any of your support as James Wilson Institute members. And after this event and in the coming weeks, um, we'll be in touch uh, with all of you as we're in touch with everyone on our mailing list about uh, supporting our work so that programs like this can continue. Second, uh, because we're so grateful for your presence tonight, we will have a reception uh, with a bar and uh, hors d'oeuvres in the lobby outside. And we would also ask that you please enjoy as much as you can the Gibson's Bakery provided cookies <laughs> that we were grateful to have flown in from Ohio earlier this week. And the Gibson family in particular was just so enthused with the 
uh, appearance that we were hosting uh, from Professor Jacobson that they put together a, a small little package of goodies. And it's my pleasure to present to you, Bill, a Gibson's hat, a Gibson's bottle opener, and this Gibson's tote bag. Thank you.